trying to explain to my three-year-old son that mom has to go away for a while, and he's asking why. I'm Rosemary Green, and this is Life Jolt. It's a CBC podcast about women in the correctional system. You'll hear our struggles. Like, they're denying me human contact. And our successes. He had his crib, he had his mom, he had his toys. It was amazing for everyone, even the guards. Available now on CBC Listen or wherever you get your podcasts. This is a CBC Podcast. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1. I'm Phelan Johnson. Indigenous people have frequently been the subject matter in documentaries, but we haven't always had a say in how we were represented. In recent years, we're seeing more and more Indigenous people on the silver screen, but also behind the camera telling our stories the way we want to. Today on the show, we're talking all about Indigenous documentaries, from the history of Indigenous docs to how filmmakers today are reframing the stories being told. There's been many wrongs done in the past. And today, we don't even trust the white man coming under this reservation. You cannot blame us for that. We don't want to be a Canadian citizen. That's a clip from the documentary, You Are on Indian Land. It was released in 1969 by the National Film Board. They told us a long time ago that we were North American Indians. And today we feel this way too. You Are on Indian Land was directed by Michael Gunadegeo Mitchell, a Mohawk filmmaker from Akwesasne. He also narrated the film. The people of Akwesasne, which the white man calls the St. Regis Reservation, have lived on this land long before the two countries decided to draw a line between themselves. Michael was part of what is known as the Indian Film Crew. It was the first all-Indigenous unit at the NFB. The use of the word Indian was a product of the time, so I'm using it in a historical context. I'm talking about quote-unquote Indian, as in Indigenous. So Michael was one of seven Indigenous members who made up the Indian Film Crew. There was also Ojibwe filmmaker Roy Daniels, Tom O'Connor, who is Anishinaabe, Barbara Wilson, who is Haida, Noel Starblanket, who is Cree, and Mi'kmaq filmmakers Morris Isaac and Willie Dunn. So the crew represented many nations. Members also created a number of important works, documentaries like These Are My People. I'm a Mohawk, and I was born on this reservation. And... I was raised here, and i done a lot of traveling in my times among the other nations in this continent in North America. And, and films uh, like The Other Side of the Ledger, an Indian view on the Hudson's Bay Company. In 1670, Charles II granted the Company of Adventures trading into Hudson's Bay, otherwise known as the Hudson's Bay Company. This charter, giving the company an absolute trade monopoly, over one million square miles of land in what is now Canada. The Indian film crew was established at a time when Indigenous people were often the subjects of documentaries, but weren't behind the cameras, creating the films themselves. In 1968, a man named George Stoney, who was an executive director at the NFB, decided it was time to put the camera in the hands of Indigenous people. He said... There was a strong feeling among the filmmakers at the NFB that the board had been making too many films about the Indian, all from the white man's viewpoint. But what would be the difference if Indians started making films themselves? And so in 1968, the Indian film crew was created. You Are on Indian Land was one of the most influential and widely distributed films made by the crew. It documents a 1969 protest by the Mohawks of Akwesasne, a territory that straddles the Canadian-U.S. border. That line was not meant for Indians, and our right to cross it with our belongings, paying no duty, was confirmed in the Jay Treaty of 1794. The Canadian government never got around to making this treaty into law. And now they say we must pay duty on our groceries as we carry them to our houses if we happen to cross their line. Many of us have to pay a dollar to cross the bridge they built on our land. And they even build a custom house there too, without our consent. The film screened across the continent, including at the 1970 occupation of Alcatraz. And it's often credited with helping to mobilize a new wave of indigenous activism. 
It was made during a period of increasing political movements led by indigenous people in Canada and the U.S. Things like the Red Power Movement and the American Indian Movement. On December 18, 1968, the usual heavy traffic between the two countries ground to a stop. We decided to block the bridge. Oh, this is international, uh, put it on all the cars. Uh, Give it to some of the other kids, pass it around. Yeah. So I'll put it on the inside. Then the police arrived. Well, I can't allow the road to be uh, blocked, understand? This is contrary to your, our laws. Well, you understand yeah, also that this is part of the reserve. No, right? I understand. And also, your under the Indian Act, that's a trespass. Mm. Quite this, all right. These are our lands. We're just standing on it. Uh, we're having a meeting now, and uh, we are Indians on our own land. And if anybody comes on and causes trouble, <clears throat> we charge them with trespass. Well, that's all right. But now I'm asking you, fellas, to get off the roadway. No, you're on Indian land, under the section 31 of the Indian Act, specifically to a uh, peace officer. What about Any the code of blocking the road? This is then, part of the reserve, yeah, no? Uh, yeah, then there was a... Uh, well, I don't understand you. Until, until, okay, until they can prove it different. Tell us we're not on Indian land. Then you can come in and arrest who you are. Mm -hmm. But up well, until that now, time... Anybody not... interfering with us will have to arrest you. This is... Uh, I'm sorry. Well, I'm afraid you're going to have a lot of people to arrest. <laughs> I suppose. Uh, when You Are on Indian Land was released in 1969, it was wrongfully attributed to a Canadian filmmaker who worked on the production. Michael Mitchell, the Mohawk filmmaker from Akwesasne who directed and narrated it, wasn't properly credited for his work. I got in touch with Michael to ask him about the film and his experiences with the crew. We get to Montreal at the National Film Board. We trained there for a few months. After a few months, they sent us out uh, on location, and during that time, they they gave us a camera and some recording equipment, and they said, go out and come back with something that you shoot. It's uh, of your own uh, uh, idea. Mm -hmm. I came home and uh, started um, recording some of the meetings, but at that time, there was this uh, issue with border crossing. At the time, Canadian authorities were prohibiting the Mohawks of Akwesasne from making duty-free purchases at the Canadian-U.S. border, taking away a right established by the Jay Treaty of 1794. Michael started recording what was going on, first at a few meetings, then at the protest. And uh, it became an international uh, situation because we blocked the bridge for that whole day and uh, that the... Um, the National Film Board crew came and, and gave us a hand, but uh, we got to film all of it. You Are on Indian Land became a hot topic. Michael and the crew began getting invites to speak at universities all over Canada. So I was presenting and kind of like learning on the job at the same time. Presenting, uh, explaining, got political meetings in Ottawa. So it was quite a... Uh, experience, uh, if I can put it that way. But despite the presentations and the political meetings, You Are an Indian Land was attributed to another filmmaker. They didn't want to give any recognition. They were afraid. Uh, the fact that it was my idea, it was uh, initiated, I did the storyboard for it and, 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 and did the presentation, got them to approve that it became a film project. Uh, but at the end, they said... Um, we're only going to go with people who are permanent employees of the film board. You're, you're a training, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You're controversial. You know, we don't give any recognition at this time. But in 2017, nearly 50 years after the film was originally released, the NFB reissued You Are an Indian Land, this time giving Michael his proper due. I got the phone call saying, the man that was in charge that got the original credit as being the film producer, uh, director, etc., said it's Mike Mitchell's film. It's it's his all the way. And um, so he wrote a letter to them saying, why don't you give him credit now? And as he started a movement, his name was Mort Ransom. Mort Ranson, the man originally credited for the film, was a technician on the project. The actor had won a couple of awards that... 
he uh, accepted in my name and in the film crew name. Uh, I always took the position that's not. He was just a technician. The, the film crew was the one who was solely responsible. But those were the humps and bruises we went through at the time to uh, to get recognition. Um, we were an oddity, and uh, we were treated as such until we broke through the barrier. In 1970, two years after the Indian film crew was established, funding was suspended, and the crew stopped production. Although short-lived, the influence of the crew was deep. Yeah, we were taught how to use the media to express indigenous issues, to bring it to the forefront, to represent the interest of your own people. Um, I don't have anything negative to say about it uh, because we had to use uh, creativity and imagination to make it work. And if you just wanted to wait for somebody to hand it to you, uh, it didn't It didn't work. It didn't happen. You grab the bull by the horn and you do what you can with it. You know? And that's how we learn. And nowadays, uh, the equipment is in your cell phone. It's... Um, Everything is so different nowadays. It almost seems like ancient history. You Are an Indian Land is still used today as a teaching tool because of how it captured so much of what was happening politically at the time. Director Michael Gunadigeo Mitchell went on to become the Grand Chief of Akwesasne. Today he works for the Assembly of First Nations, where he is an elder in residence and serves as an advisor to the National Chief. Documentaries made by the Indian Film Crew can be watched for free online on the National Film Board's website. For a deeper dive into the Indian Film Crew, you can tune into my podcast, The Secret Life of Canada, and check out our episode, Why You Should Know About the Indian Film Crew. Thanks to CBC Podcasts for letting us excerpt some of the tape from that episode. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. I'm Phelan Johnson talking all about the work of Indigenous documentary filmmakers on the show this week. Still ahead? Gone are the days, I think, where people, especially if it's about Indigenous content, that you can just kind of, hey, I've got this great idea and I'm not a part of this community, but here's what I want to pilfer from from your stories. And and we just, we felt it was important to have a, not only a, a woman-run and woman-operated company, which also is so desperately needed in the film industry, but to have one that is based in the north and a majority Inuit owned company so that we can, you know, be be advocating for the people of the north and, and how they're represented as well. More on that in just a few minutes. I married a white man in nineteen thirty eight and yet there's that law that you're not Indian anymore when you marry a non Indian. If you marry a non Indian you're out. We lose our right to vote here. We lose our property. You can't do that, you know. Who you like can stay and who you don't give a damn you have to go. Who are they to make that kind of a law? Jeez. That's a clip from the new documentary, Mary Two Acts Early, I Am Indian Again. You might not know the name Mary Two Acts Early, but you should. Mary was a Mohawk activist who fought to challenge discrimination against First Nations women, and she became a key figure in Canada's women's rights movement. My next guest wanted to tell Mary's story and make sure her legacy wasn't forgotten. Courtney Montour wrote and directed the documentary, which will be premiering at Hot Docs Film Festival this year. Courtney Montour is Mohawk from Ganawage, and she joins me today from Montreal. Welcome to the show, Courtney. Hi, Niamh Fallon. Nice to be on the show. So for listeners who aren't yet familiar with her, can you describe who Mary 2X Early was and and how she became a champion for women's rights? The main thing is Mary took on Canada. She took on this country to challenge sex discrimination in the Indian Act, uh, discrimination against First Nations women. And she inspired a movement that so many women continue to work on today. And so how did Mary, um, how did Mary lose her status? She, she married somebody who was non-Indian. You know, we're speaking about the Canadian government and Indian status. So First Nations are considered, you know, status Indian or, or you're not status Indian. 
what the issue was in the Indian Act is that First Nations women who married a non-Indian man lost their status and so did their children. But an Indian man who married a non-Indian woman, that woman would gain Indian status and so were their children. Why was it so important for Mary to have status under the Indian Act? And what did she what did she stand to lose by not having it? What she fought for and what's ongoing today is that it's that disconnect from community. You're now, according to the Canadian government, a second class citizen. Some of these things, again, the, these are residual effects that are still happening today. So there are thousands of women um, who still aren't registered under the Indian Act, who have court cases uh, that are tied up in courts. These women aren't compensated for all this time as well. And so how common was it for women to lose their status under the Indian Act? Very, very common. That that was the law. And it's a specific way to really tear our communities apart, to eliminate, you know, Indians through legislation. And so I met with um, several people in, in Mary's home, uh, Jody Callahoo Stonehouse, uh, who lives in Edmonton, and her daughter, Isabella, two individuals who were, you know, impacted by these laws and, and how their lives were changed by Mary's work. Like, they're an example of that legacy. So I brought them to Gunawage, along with Mary's son, Ed, to sit around the kitchen table in Mary's home and listen to these old audio recordings of Mary. And while we're there, that's one of the things that Jody mentioned, is that, you know, these laws, it's just a way to, it's a genocidal act. It's a way to reduce our numbers and eliminate us. I'm curious, what happened when Mary took up this fight to regain her status? It was such a long fight. She started in 1968. And the first change in the law, in the Indian Act, through Mary's work and of these women was in 1985 with Bill C-31. I mean, to go through government after government and to constantly be denied, it's just the motivation and persistence and patience that Mary had. And at the same time, the compassion and love that she showed to the women around her who were living in fear because of these laws. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it just a lot of our women are leading in that same way today. And what made you want to make a documentary about Mary Two Axe early? Coming from the same community as her, both being Mohawk women from Gunawage, her name, I always grew up knowing about her. There's, you know, a chapter in a book or her name's mentioned in the newspaper, but there wasn't that much more out there. And I think it's, it's time that we celebrate our First Nations women's stories and our accomplishments. And, you know, someone like Mary Tuex Early took on Canada, changed a country. Um, and through the process of making the film, I realized how much of an impact that she had on women's rights as a whole in this country by speaking with so many people, so many non-Indigenous women. And I think that's important for Canadians to know as, as a whole. And your documentary uses a lot of archival materials to tell this story. In your film, we see these old reels of audio recordings, which you were mentioning. Um, where did you get those and what role do they play in the film? So the, the basis of of creating the film was audio recordings from filmmaker Alanisa Bomswin. And, you know, she's such an important figure um, for bringing our Indigenous issues to the forefront, for paving the way for Indigenous filmmakers. During that time, Alanis had mentioned that she had these audio recordings that she had made with Mary um, back in 1984, that she had sat with Mary in, in Mary's Gunawage home at the kitchen table and, you know, for several months, they just sat there and, and, and talked. And 
Alanis had asked me if, if I would like to do something with this. So these audio recordings became the backbone of the film. It gave Mary the chance to say her own story in her own words. So it's not a historical documentary. She's really, she's speaking to us and taking us on this journey. In addition to using archival audio and footage, um, you did many interviews in the making of this documentary. Uh, let's hear a clip. And I was curious for you, Isabella, I mean, you're 17, <laughs> you know, have one of these cards. It's a possibility. I mean, what, what are your feelings on, on the status card for, for yourself? I feel like it's kind of like a place where I don't know if I want it because I don't want to be part of the Indian Act where other people determine who I am and what I do. But also it's a part of me where I'm like, yeah, I love being Indian, that's me. But it's also like, that card isn't me. That's not who I am, but it is who I am. So it's like a balance of, what do I do? That was a clip from the new documentary, Mary Two Acts Early, I Am Indian Again, written and directed by my guest, Courtney Montour. Can you describe what was happening in that clip, Courtney? Yes. So um, you were hearing from um, Isabella Callahoo-Zeller, and um, I'm sitting around the kitchen table with her her mom, Jody Callahoo-Stonehouse, and Mary's son, Ed Tuax Early. And we're also listening to these audio recordings of Mary and reflecting on, on her legacy and, and what this means to all of us today. And for someone who's young, like Isabella, who was 17 at the time, you know, it's, it's this next generation looking forward as she's just learning about all of this and trying to figure out how, you know, what does this all mean for her and what does, what does status mean and what does, what does being First Nations mean? And it's, it's, it's very complex. I have to say that moment, it hit me really hard in the film. Um, after my parents divorced, my mom, she remarried and she remarried a white man. And I remember when we would go to the corner store, she would hide her status card um, because she was afraid someone was going to take it away. So just seeing how that continues to play out in, in our youth. Um, for you, was there a moment that has stayed with you from the film? It's, it's the process of making the film that has stood out to me the most because what I experienced over the four years of making this film was how many lives she's impacted and, and influenced people across the country took the time to write to me, to share those stories. That, that says a lot about Mary and about these First Nations women who worked on this issue. They did a lot in this country. I want to thank you for making this beautiful film. It's absolutely stunning, and I think everybody should see it. It should be in schools. It should be everywhere. It's, it's such a beautiful, important story. So thank you for making it, and thank you for speaking with us today. Yeah. Yeah. Well. That was Courtney Montour, director of the documentary, Mary Two Acts Early, I Am Indian Again. I'm Jeremy Rat. I'm half Indigenous and half white. Pieces is an all-new CBC British Columbia original podcast. This is a story of being stuck between two worlds, not really fitting in with either of them. So because I don't have darker skin or long brown hair, that therefore I was not Indigenous. You don't have to be a residential school survivor yourself to be traumatized by residential school. Pieces. Listen to it now, wherever you get your podcasts. Being spiritual is universal. For the land, it's, it's ancient. It's our kupuna, it's our ancestor. All of the people that we descend from are now of the earth. So when we connect to the earth, you're not connecting just to minerals, water, and oxygen. You're connecting to your ancestors. So being spiritual kind of like opens that gateway, right? brings you closer to them. 
That's a clip from the new documentary, Food for the Rest of Us, a new feature-length documentary that looks at the stories of racialized and marginalized people from Hawaii to the Northwest Territories and how they are using food for political action. Tiffany Ayalek is one of the producers of the film, and she joins me from Vancouver. Tiffany, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. So your documentary covers a lot of ground. Can you tell me about some of the places that you went for the documentary? Um, and is there an individual story that you that was close to your heart in this documentary? So throughout the film, we travel from the high Arctic in Nunavik and Tuktoyaktuk, right on the, the Arctic Ocean. We are in the American Midwest in Boulder and area Colorado and Kansas City, as well as Oahu. We were in Waianae in Oahu in Hawaii. And Having such a vast diversity of, you know, regions showcased in the film, and I was pinching myself the entire time and <laughs> just being like, wow, we are shooting an honest to goodness movie in Hawaii. And it was like fall time, but to us, it was the hottest, <laughs> hottest, most humid heat we have ever experienced. And uh, <laughs> it's just funny to see this, you know, mostly northern crew just dying of heat in a few places when it was just kind of every day for for all the Hawaiians. So that was that was pretty funny. Uh, and what was the story that you were covering in Hawaii? So there's this amazing, amazing farm operation, organic farm called Ma'o. And not only are they an organic farm, which produces, uh, you know, incredibly lush, abundant food. They they are also uh, a mentorship and training for youth program as well. And through working at the farm, um, they have some special arrangements with uh, the students who also participate. They can basically get all or most of their their college tuition paid for, which in a community like Waianae that is predominantly uh, Indigenous Hawaiian predominantly lower income and in a place where the the prospect or the possibility of post-secondary education is not on, on a lot of people's radar or even possible financially. To have a place like Mao that's not only growing the most amazing, lush, abundant food that is, you know, reviving traditional Hawaiian land practice that is mentoring these incredible youth into being radical, amazing political thinkers. They're also helping to support them through through their university education. And the the energy on the farm was just absolutely electric. And the the youth and the energy and the the vitality of every aspect of that farm was just so, so encouraging. And the spiritual aspect as well of what they're doing really hit home, I think, um, you know, with myself to think about like what the in context of that is and how there's so many parallels to be drawn that are so distinct to us mm. um, in our own cultural context, but are totally rooted in, in something so, so universal. Mm. I can tell you're really passionate about this. And one of the themes that runs through the documentary, um, one of the storylines is about food security. How is food security personal for you? I'm a northerner. I'm an Inuk from a small town in the subarctic. And most of my family lives in the high Arctic, where we have experienced incredible food insecurity. And the exorbitant cost of shipping a mango to Anuvik or to Tuktoyaktuk is incredible. And people don't understand the journey that some of these imported foods have to go to. And by the time that poor thing makes it up to some of these higher Arctic communities, it's closer to compost than it is to something that's edible and good for you. So I think that shedding a light on how food sovereignty plays a role into indigenous sovereignty and to autonomy of, of marginalized people is super important to draw those connections because it's something that we need to do every day. If you don't know where your next meal comes from, that is another systematic way to keep marginalized people suppressed. So food security is something for sure that my family, that other Inuit have had to deal with and is an ongoing struggle. So I feel like 
for me, it was really important to show what food sovereignty and food security looks like outside of a northern context, because the farther afield we went outside the north, we started to see that, oh, Hawaii, even though, you know, it's uh, in an ocean a world away from the high Arctic, is experiencing um, that same precarity to their food system. And food security and food sovereignty is a huge thing that island folks have to deal with, and that there was a lot of correlations from indigenous perspectives in Hawaii as well. So it was just really cool to see that even though we're worlds away, the impulse and the heart of the matter was definitely the same. The director for Food for the Rest of Us is Caroline Cox. Can you tell me a bit more about how you two got connected? Because I know you've worked together before. So Caroline um, has lived up in the Northwest Territories for a long, long time. And we actually connected over Wild Kitchen. Wild Kitchen is a documentary lifestyle series that um, follows really interesting uh, different people from across the North who are closely connected to their food in one way or another. So she wanted to, to spotlight um, amazing, interesting people from across Northwest Territories who were living really closely connected to the land and who were, whether in their big or small ways, were harvesting birch sap or taking their kids out to fishing camps or learning how to cook a jackfish in the ground and, you know, all of the amazing things that we got to do in Wild Kitchen. And um, and she approached me to be the host of it. And that's how we started to work together um, and started our, our sort of business and friendship collaboration was, was working on this show. So how did Wild Kitchen lead you to creating your documentary Food for the Rest of Us? So it was through being immersed in this global community of, of um, like-minded and sort of food-based and land-based practice people that we were able to start seeing, okay, this is a bigger thing that is not just like a, a, a niche northern thing that we were involved in. And I started following this this person on Instagram who uh, my sister kind of put me onto. And he's a, a black indigenous farmer who was living in Kansas City at the time. And he was just doing some really interesting content and drawing some pretty incredible correlations and observations about the sort of the black and indigenous experience as it relates to land practice, land use and relationship to the land. And his politics were always so closely and intrinsically tied to his ability to provide food to his community. And as an urban farmer in um, Kansas City, which in, in Missouri, which was one of the last states to abolish slavery, the long tendrils of slavery, of colonization, the, the ongoing devastating effects of racism are things that are up front and center for a lot of Black folks, especially in, in the states and especially in those types of states. And so he would making these posts and saying things like, one of the most radical things you can do is put your hands in the dirt and grow your own food. And he had this amazing content on Instagram. And I started following him and just being, you know, completely enthralled at the connections that he was drawing um, to to land practice and, and land connection and sovereignty through food. And that's that's one of the things that really sparked us to to start looking at, let's make a doc about this because the most amazing marginalized, um, you know, racialized people, oppressed people are once again have a, an amazing solution and have several solutions to help lead us out of food precarity and food instability, which to be honest, after a year of the pandemic, I think everybody has a clearer idea that our food systems are incredibly fragile and need to change. I have to say, watching the film, I didn't expect there to be so many um, emotional moments. People are very emotional about food. It's so It's so amazing to me because I feel like um, intrinsically, I think it's something that we all uh, experience in one way or another. Food for so many people is not just the act of acquiring calories and nutrients. Mm -hmm. You know, food is medicine. Food is community. Food is tied to our culture. Food is tied to, you know, indigenous land use rights and our ability to like hunt and fish and trap and feed ourselves and maintain, you know, cultural practice. Food is 
how you comfort somebody who's going through grief. Food is how we celebrate when something is amazing. So I feel like food is so huge and plays so many different roles in our lives. And I think I think a lot of us understand that, but now what we're trying to do is to to highlight that food as politic and food as um, as activism and food as liberation is also a conversation we need to be having now. And that's incredibly emotional. And so many of the people in their own ways in the film talk about the healing from, from traumas past, present, and future that um, we can have access to that type of healing through land and through food. And that, of course, is, is emotional and very empowering, um, I think, for, for the people that we're showing um, in the film. Food for the Rest of Us is a production from your own media company, Copper Quartz Media. Copper Quartz Media is a northern-based, majority Inuit-owned, and 100% woman-operated company. Why did you decide to start your own media company? When we were talking about the success of Wild Kitchen and like the momentum that it was getting and the things that we wanted to do in the future, we saw a real hole in the in the industry we wanted to be able to have uh, a really professional polished film company based born and bred out of the Northwest territories, because especially in the North, there's a lot of films that go up to the North and they sort of exotify and they sort of tokenize aspects of the North, but have no relationship and no accountability to the North. And so we wanted to offer the opportunity for people who are interested in some aspect of Northern stories to say, okay, the time is over when you could just fly in and kind of do whatever you want and kind of manic of the North and, and not compensate people and not give, you know, um, the people that you're representing in your communities any any say or any autonomy in how they're represented and that that's no longer acceptable in the film industry and that you need to be partnering, you need to be fostering relationships and accountability into the budget line and into the way that you create these these films. We just, we felt it was important to have a not only a, a woman-run and woman-operated company, which also is so desperately needed in the film industry, but to have one that is based in the North and a majority Inuit-owned company so that we can, you know, be be advocating for the people of the North and, and how they're represented as well. And I think it's interesting because you mentioned Nanook of the North, um, the uh, I want to say, quote-unquote, documentary film um, put out by Robert J. Flaherty. Um, and... It, that is cited as a documentary film and one of the first documentary films that showed um, people in the North. Um, and now you're behind the camera sort of taking back that power. Uh, do you feel a, a sense of responsibility? I, I feel lots of things. And I feel a responsibility for sure, because in terms of writing the narrative or writing the wrongs and the harms that I feel like some of these films have contributed to, you know, public opinion or misinformation or prejudice or ignorance that these films tend to sort of proliferate and, you know, keep keep going, you know, that were these simple, childlike, innocent people who live in igloos and uh, aren't we cute and charming and we have a hundred words for snow, you know, like I feel like all of those things harm our community and they're certainly not helping. And so I I do feel like there is an incredible hole historically in how Inuit people, Northern people, women have been portrayed because they've always been through the lens of the other. And we've always been exotified or simplified or demonized or, you know, we've been two dimensionalized in all of these ways. And, and I feel like, thank goodness, thank goodness now we're in a time where there are, you know, more women behind and in front of the camera and in the writing rooms and that there are key creatives who are Indigenous people on higher budget, big budget things that are commercially successful. And I just feel like anything we can be doing to help keep that momentum to um, sort of balance the conversation and write some of the, the wrongs that the industry has allowed to happen is really important to me. Tiffany, congratulations on the film, and thank you so much for speaking with me today. Thanks so much for having me, Phelan. Tiffany Ayalik is one of the producers of the new documentary, Food for the Rest of Us. It's premiering at the Doxa Documentary Film Festival and can be viewed across the country through the festival's website until May 16th. The All-Native Basketball Tournament is a big deal. All-Native is the biggest thing for us. It's the most exciting thing one time of the year. He played for two years. And then when they found out that he was born Haitian and we adopted him, they said, well, he can't play. 
And one of their rules was that an individual had to be born with at least one eighth indigenous blood. That is a type of a blood quantum rule. That's a colonial. that's a clip from Yasmin Maturin's new film, One of Ours. It's Josiah Wilson's story. The Haitian-born adopted son of a Heltzik First Nation family was initially not allowed to play in an all-Native basketball tournament. All-Native basketball said at the time that he did not meet the bloodline requirements, even though Josiah has Indian status through his family. After his family filed a human rights complaint, the All-Native Basketball Committee apologized and allowed him to play that year. But the event left Josiah to wonder about his own identity and self. Yasmin is the director of the film, which premieres at Hot Docs Canadian International Documentary Festival this year. She joins us now to talk about it. Welcome to the show, Yasmin. Hi, happy to be here. So can you tell us in a bit more detail what happened to Josiah and how he felt as a result of it? When he was banned from playing at the All-Native Basketball Tournament, it was a news that kind of came out of nowhere, especially because he had played at the tournament two years prior and there wasn't any issues. And so he was really disappointed and he was confused, angry, and sad. And so was his family and so was the Heltzik Nation. And so what ended up happening afterwards was that you know, his community kind of rallied around him to affirm his identity and to, to also tell the committee that he is Heltzik Nation. The gravity of the situation was was felt, especially with, with his family, because, you know, to, to invoke a blood quantum rule as the reason to exclude somebody who clearly is part of that community was something that was much bigger than, than him in, in a lot of ways. You actually knew Josiah and his family a bit before all of this happened, um, before you started making this film. So what was it about Josiah's story that made you want to help tell it? Yeah, I mean, we I grew up with Josiah, specifically his sister Mariah, who's in the film. Um, her and I were part of a Haitian cultural dance group. Um, and we would kind of perform at community gatherings, um, Independence Day dinners. Um, and, and I remember when we were part of that group, Josiah was always, you know, he would always be there. Just He would just be a super hyper kid playing basketball in the background. Um, and so I think when the story broke, I was interested in how he was doing as a person, um, especially because I think in the news, when we when we bring in these questions of indigeneity and um, and racism and, and blackness and all what a, what all of these things mean, there's such big questions. And I think for me, I I was really curious about the human experience of having to carry the responsibility of those questions in some ways. And and I think that was kind of what really um, got me interested in in wanting to make this project and tell this story and and really dig into how Josiah feels about himself and his place in the world. And how do you think anti-black racism played a role in this story? It, it played a, a huge role. I think he was singled out because his blackness is visible, you know, and his indigeneity is not. In a lot of ways what I found that was really interesting is that Josiah sort of wears his blackness and his indigeneity with pride. Like he has, there's no doubt that he knows that he's Haitian. He knows he's black. He knows he's Heltzuk. Um And I think what what is kind of interesting is that, you know, the way that the story sort of evolved and became this thing, it's, it's, it's almost more like the world is, is, is more shocked about his identity than he is in, in a lot of ways. And I think there's something um, powerful and really interesting about the contrast of that. It's not necessarily an identity struggle. When I think about myself and my own sense of connection to my blackness, I feel like it's changed over time. And I think for him, he's kind of just feeling it out. He's feeling it out with where he's at right now. And I think over time, it will change like it does for everybody. How has Josiah's life and perspective changed since that 2016 incident? It's something that happened to him that he never thought was going to scale 
to a point of like having a film made and all these things and that we still talk about it years later. He was a bit of a reluctant hero in a lot of ways in the process of, of this. At multiple points, there's there's all these instances where uh, the health community sort of, you know, rallied around him to kind of affirm him within his community. And towards the end, I don't want to give away anything, but he's able to sort of experience something so incredible um, and I think there's so, that's something that that stay that's going to stay with him. Healing is not something that's linear. It's something that is such a difficult, challenging process. And for him, as an as an adoptee and and as somebody who sits at all these different intersections, there's a lot of layers to his experience as a human person, and and it's just gonna take time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what do you hope that viewers take away from your film? I hope that the story sort of expands people's imagination of what it means to be Black and what it means to be Indigenous and what it means to kind of sit at, at with these two worlds. Um, I, I also hope that it challenges folks to really look at anti-Black racism in their own communities. When we talk about anti-Black racism, I feel like sometimes those conversations are kind of almost Black and white. Like, and, and also... I also kind of get the sense that a lot of times those conversations assume that anti-blackness exists in white spaces. But I think anti-black racism is pervasive and it's everywhere. The work to fight against that is, is, is the onus of that is, is on everybody. Well, thank you for taking the time to chat with us today. I am very excited to see this film. Awesome. I'm really excited for you guys to see it. And thank you so much for having me. That was Yasmin Maturin, director of the documentary One of Ours. That's it for this week's episode of Unreserved. If you want to get in touch with us, email unreserved at cbc.ca or find us on Facebook or Twitter. This episode was produced by Kyle Muzika, Zoe Tennant, Kata Dak, Sean Vanderklis, and Anna Lazowski. I'm Phelan Johnson. Now a go for listening. For more CBC Podcasts, go to cbc.ca slash podcasts.